June 5th Community Resource Committee meeting of the Town Council, and we're going to start at 2.35 p.m. And I need a volunteer amongst us to take minutes. Everybody is looking at, yeah. the, let the record show that everyone's looking at their shoes. Okay. Um, Was that a yes? I will do it if no one else. Dorothy, I'll take you out for dinner. No, you just have to do the minutes the next time. No. No, okay, I do understand. I, I, I debated saying no minutes, but I'll, I will take the minutes. I can do it next time. Okay. So, um, yeah, yeah, I will. So Andy will. No, and, Andy no. gets a break. Okay. Uh, uh, he just did his yeah, report. Yeah, we have a rotation. So, so um, we have the, really the agenda, and thank you, Dave, for passing them out, is call to order, done, public comments, continued discussion of goals, discussion of procedures and policies, discussion of our meeting with the zoning subcommittee, and then planning for the possibility of a retreat, and then business not anticipated 48 hours before the meeting, and then adjourn. So we haven't met in, um, two or three weeks, three weeks, in part because one of our meetings wasn't properly posted, and then we took a break last week so that we could attend the an economic development forum that was at UMass. So we're back in session. So, and actually one thing I do want to talk about with the council, and this will be under, uh, with the committee, and this will be under business not anticipated 48 hours, is our schedule going forward. So remind me to talk about that if I forget to. So why don't we start off with public comment? So actually, we're, it's nice to see so many of you here today. So if anyone wants to speak about anything that might be under our purview, speak now. Perhaps you can tell us what is under your purview. I'm sorry, one more time? So perhaps you can describe to us okay. what is under your purview. Basically, everything under the, um, the purpose of, the count of this group is to advise the town council on matters related to the economic vitality and quality of life in Amherst. We shall focus on the following areas among others, planning, zoning, land use, and the master plan, community and economic development, including art and culture, housing mix, housing affordability, and neighborhoods. So that's the primary purpose. Thank you. So that got some hands up. <coughs> Button. Here, that, bu that button, yes, that button. Um, my name is Ann Belt Yee, and I live at 29 Dana Place, right off of Dana Street. And I wanted to talk today for a number of reasons. I think that um, there's been, there's got a couple different points. Um, one is that uh, it's at Valley CDC, met with you all on April 23rd, and that's when they got the approval to move forward. Correct? Uh, Valley CDC did not meet with us. Their oh, your committee uh, met. The uh, Community Preservation um, Committee met. Yes. The CPA met with us to present their property. Okay, okay, I misspoke. That's so, the, and the CPAC re, re, uh, recommendation was approved. At that time, um, no, it has. Well, this group, yeah, I wasn't present at that particular meeting. The um, those of the four that were present voted to endorse basically this, okay. the CPA proposal. Okay, and that recommendation has been transmitted to the full council. The full council has not voted. And yes, the, the finance the finance committee has not yet voted on this. Correct. Okay. okay. Yeah. So it's it, it, this was one of our first meetings, and we truthfully didn't go into any detail, didn't have that much before us, looked pretty good on the, on the surface, and we voted yes. Okay. Those who are here, he was not here. Okay, very good. So, and then the subsequent day, the next day, April 24th, the neighborhood and the abutters were alerted to the fact that there was a 132 Northampton Road project that was being proposed and had received preliminary approval. We believe that Valley CDC knew of this schedule of the approval and then alerted us after the fact. 
So we feel, and I say we, I, people I've spoken with, um, feel a little bit that their they're, uh, transparency, transparency has been lacking. Um, and that doesn't set up for a good, a good follow through on some levels. Um, so then I have some questions to ask. Um, we all want to, I want to make a statement first. We all want to help the most vulnerable of our citizens and we want, to succeed, want this to succeed for the residents, the neighborhood and the town. Um, at that meeting on the 24th, um, Valley CDC received all of the emails of the neighborhood and took the concerns that had been printed out and then they responded to those concerns on, I think, directly to the council or to the town, but they did not respond to all the emails that they had acquired directly at all. They only responded to the town. Therefore, also, albeit they had taken the emails as in a goodwill effort to be in contact or to be transparent with the, the neighborhood, did not do that. They actually were not treating the neighborhood like, like really serious stakeholders in this plan. They were going another angle. Um, and that makes us also feel like they're not being transparent with us. Um, furthermore, uh, there was mention, I was not at this meeting, and one of my neighbors might be able to clarify the exact words used, that there were really no problems in the neighborhood to be worried about in Northampton. The other SROs were fine. Nothing was going on, and you will not find anything, or I would be surprised if you found anything. The emergency service records and logs show otherwise. Not only were there problems within the housing units alone with overdoses, but there was noise disturbances as well as vandalism in the neighborhood. So that again is a transparency issue. We have everything to gain, the neighborhoods and the neighbors and the tenants for being transparent. We have everything to gain for this being a win-win. We would like this to be a win. We would like this to work if it's gonna be in our neighborhood. We want it to work and we want it to work well. And we're sincere about that. You should see the, hear the conversations going on. How is this gonna work? How are they being supported? How are they not being supported? And is the size too big? Is it gonna, it, the other houses, and there's been some grids made of the problems in the emergency report logs in Northampton that go up, up exponentially according to the size of the unit. This is a family neighborhood. Kids are running around. We don't want the vandalism. We don't want that. If we wanted that, we'd have bought houses down near the fraternities and on, you know, near UMass. And someone made, you know, someone took, made light of my concern of the vandalism. They said, I'm sure there are other homes in Amherst that have this problem too. And I said, yeah, but did you want to live there? Maybe you didn't buy a house there either for those reasons. So we're not saying that this is going to happen. We're saying that the records in Northampton show that it has happened. And we would like the supports to be in place so that people can have a success in their home and in the neighborhood. I also want to address one other topic. This gets on to the more personal level. Um, I have a long history in Amherst. I was raised here. Uh, I helped the black sheep open. Yep, on the ground floor. Nick Seaman had people out front protesting because it was named the black sheep. They thought that was derogatory. Yes. He raised black sheep. It was not derogatory. He raised black sheep, okay? Um, I worked at the Every Woman's Center for Violence Against Women. I did education at UMass as a volunteer. I worked in Washington, D.C. on a nonprofit for human rights issues in Central America. The issues of having a voice, representation, okay? All of these were relevant. I have seen firsthand where impressions and good intentions have not led to good outcomes. My concern is that this project, the details of this project were not adequately looked at and that there was a little bit thrown to the wind or we'll fix it as we go, something like that to make it work or make it to come good. That's not good enough for us. 
We live there. We want it to work. We'll welcome people into our neighborhood. We will greet people. But, it, but make it so it's going to work and so that they can have success. Secondly, I know this is going on. I have personal experience with some of these issues. In high school, my boy boyfriend was an African-American from inner city, New York City. He was, a, he was a boys club scholarship recipient. Most of the people in his neighborhood back in New York City either ended up in jail or dead. At 23, I dated a guy in Wyoming. He was an ex-con. I moved to Seattle, he followed me. He was also a drug user. He took up drugs again. He was clean when I met him. He took up drugs again in Seattle, and he was homeless. He wasn't able to move in with me. I didn't want him necessarily living with me. He was homeless. He was a good guy. He was kind. He was honest, and he was dishonest. He was not dangerous. He was a user. I don't want us to be profiled any more than you want us to profile anybody who's going to be moving into these affordable housing projects, not projects, excuse me, programs or buildings. It's not fair. People have made issue with us because we live in the neighborhood we live in, because we do happen to be all mostly white. My husband's not, he's an immigrant, and he was persecuted in his country of origin, and he came here. I think that it is incumbent on the council members to talk to each other and not allow profiling to happen regarding us any more than we will allow it to happen regarding people who are needing this housing and for whom we are willing to offer support. Please consider us an ally in making this work. Thank you. So we don't normally respond to public comment, and I, I think we're also encouraged to be flexible, so I think we can, you know, be, uh, but I just wanted to say one thing. So this is, so the town council has been in existence for six months, um, and it took much of those six months for us to figure out how we were gonna organize ourselves. And one of the last pieces was this committee, the Community Resource Committee, which was officially approved, I think, April 11th. And, and then April 24th was our second meeting. So I was also contacted about the, I, pr I can only speak for myself, so I also learned about that particular site as the location of this, probably after you, or around the same time as you, through some sort, kind of an email blast. And the, the timing was, I think that the two meetings were on either on the same night or you know, some sort of a weird, um, coincidence like that, I think if we were to do it again, we might, we, you know, we, I don't know what we would do if we were to do it again, but the timing was not, was not ideal. That I can acknowledge that the, the I don't think that would, there was any bad intention on the part of anyone. So I think that um, as far as I can understand, looking back through the way that this evolved, that there had been various indications from the Valley CDC and from the town itself that, that this site was being considered, that the site was purchased, that this was what the intent was. I think that the town council was busy organizing itself, that we, it, it may have slipped off, you know, our own radar screens as something that we could be paying attention to earlier. But I don't think that there's any bad intentions on the part of any of the groups involved in this. And I totally understand how this would feel like it was a surprise to you. So if we played a role in that, then, um, you know, that's unfortunate, but. So there is this meeting on, a, so the most important vote is the vote of the town council, which will happen after this community meeting on June 18th, which I assume that you're all aware of at the Bang Center, okay. So we need to go, what I'd like, I think that, mm -hmm. we're, let's go through that meeting and see what comes out of that. I have a couple of comments. Um, as I say, Steve wasn't here, he's the chair, but he, he had told us he wouldn't be here and I was uh, acting chair. Um, we approved it 
without looking into it and going into any detail. It was presented to us as, as something that seemed like a useful and necessary act and that there were no problems of any kind. And I was under the wrong impression of where it was. I kept driving around trying to find the address. And I thought it was further down on, on Northampton Avenue towards University Drive. And I thought, OK, this makes some sense. This is almost in this commercial area, and it was really close to the shopping, and it wasn't until after the vote that I realized, no, it really was abutting two really residential neighborhoods. So that is, and as I say, we were, we were brand new. I really think that it's a major point you're making. Um, the word profiling is the word I couldn't remember all week. I kept coming up with stereotyping, but I, it, profiling is the right word. Um, and it's been going on, um, and we have been, whatever side you're on, you're accused of pro profiling the other side. No good discussion will ever happen if that's what we do, okay? And I've seen virtue signaling on all sides. I mean, we just have to talk about it. Um, but I will tell you, Steve, that some people spoke to me today and they told me, because I said, as, as you did, I assumed that they would all be at this um, meeting on the 18th and uh, I was told something that I haven't had a chance to verify, that uh, Valley CDC would be given a certain amount of time to make a presentation, but that the neighbors and residents would not. So I, I, I bring that up. And so that is why some of them are saying they're not going to participate. Then if they don't participate, then the purpose, we're not going to get anywhere. So I'm going to respond to that first. Uh, that's not my, uh, things can change. But my understanding was that it was being facilitated, it's a facilitated conversation right. with representatives from various things, um, your neighborhood, um, the, um, probably the housing trust, probably Valley, but there would also be an empty chair so that there would be ongoing ability for people to move in and out of the conversation. Um, as they wanted to respond to comments. That, now, that's the last I heard, so I haven't heard anything right. like that. So I, I said, when I have a follow-up, that, oh, well, she's going to, Kate, Kate says she has some information, but that I would certainly bring this up with Lynn, because the idea, Lynn's idea was to bring about yeah. some venue where people could talk that's and fair. talk with each other and not just, yeah, you know, no, so I'm, I'm going to try to get us back on track. Did you have your hand up at some? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Please. Yes. Um, I, we are a young committee. We're young counselors, uh, with the exception of Andy and Alyssa. We don't have governmental experience. However, I really am uncomfortable, uh, and I've said this before, with the premise that we weren't. We just thought this was a good idea, kind of thing, and. We didn't do our homework because I did. Mm -hmm. And we don't necessarily agree, but I'm listening. I'm hearing what you're saying, and I, I say that with an open heart. I researched this. I went and visited SROs. I've read the master plan about, you know, I've done as much as I could. Um, and I'm doing more by checking out things you're sharing with me. Um, so I really want us to stop apologizing for being a young committee. For me, that was a decision that was done with thoughtfulness. And I don't, uh, I think it is unfair to you to think that, oh, well, we just did it. Because we did, um, maybe Dorothy did, but I don't think she yeah, means it I, again. I, I, I but I didn't. Home, but. And um, <laughs> so enough said about that. But And I will be in your neighborhood for the walk. Okay. Do you have your hand Yeah, I did. So um, just a couple things. My understanding, and uh, we can uh, inquire to make sure, is that Valley CDC is fully participating in the meeting on the 18th, and that the plan is to, it is a facilitated discussion so that uh, they're uh, essentially, as I understand, the model that's being used with the facilitator is uh, and this is a, the empty chair has a funny meaning uh, sound until it's explained that there's an inner circle and an out and then it's essentially an outer circle and the outer circles everybody is there except for people who are in this inner circle and that some people are being invited 
to be there, and I don't know how those invitations are. It was my understanding that it was to um, assure that everybody who's, uh, um, every group that's, that's spoken has some representation. But also the empty chair idea was is that if there was somebody who wanted to participate to ask some questions, that there be a place for them to join for the period of time so that the facilitator could bring extra people in. And I think that's what the concept was. Um, the Finance Committee did not vote on this. We look at it from, and as I'm speaking now for a second as chair of the Finance Committee, uh, because we look at the financial aspects of the proposals as um, opposed to other committees which have different roles and different assignments, including this one. Uh, we uh, deliberately postponed our final consideration until the 25th so that it would be after the 18th because we wanted to hear and have time to consider what was said at the community meeting and that um, at least as of now it's my understanding that the president intends to bring this uh, to the council on July 1st. Um, so that was just for informational purposes. Um, my impression was is that um, because none of the applicants um, were invited to our meeting earlier when we considered the proposals in this committee, um, it was all a report from the um, capital planning, uh, or the CPA committee, and the CPA committee um, had met with everybody, had done a lot of its homework, and uh, so that it was presenting its recommendations. Um, there were a whole series of proposals for um, CPA. No group was represented, um, and I don't think that any, that groups were probably even notified, so I would um, not assume that um, there was a decision not to participate. Um, I think it was just um, the way it was. Um, one other thing I'll note from my prior role on the select board, um, I was for several years the select board liaison for the Community Preservation Act Committee. If you go onto the um, town website under boards and committees and look Community Preservation Act Committee up, you will be able to find several things. One is the proposal itself for each of the proposals that was uh, filed. The second thing is that early in the process of their process, after receiving um, the um, proposals, committee members um, all participate in suggesting questions that they would like to pose to the, pro uh, to the proponents, the people who have submitted the proposals and then um, there are responses that are posted. And those are all on the website. So there is information, if you haven't already seen it, um, it's out there. I think that's probably all I wanted to just relate for information purposes. I, yeah, let's take more, more public comment. My comment is, I want to feel comfortable with I'm that. sorry, Kate, you'll have to identify. Oh, my name is Kate Trost. I live at 99 Dana Street. My comment is that I want to feel comfortable with the proposal for the development at 132 Northampton Road. And um, I, I've done a lot of meetings, including having Valley CDC come to, two of the members, Laura and um, Joanne, come to my house and walk around the property with me. I've met with the um, town manager and the housing planner. I've um, written letters. Um, I've met with, with um, both, my, both of my representatives, George Ryan, he's come to my house and I've talked about it. I've met with Dorothy Pam, et cetera. My observation is that 
there's kind of two, two groups of information. One is the information that I hear from the developer and from the government, and I call it sort of the administration of the project. The other information is from um, a neighbor um, who is involved in SRO and low-income housing. Um, my husband is a neurologist, and his very carefully thought through uh, um, comments and another ER doc on our road and uh, another doctor who lives in Northampton Road. And I'm finding that why am I hearing such different things from the different groups? And that's what I'm bringing to you is I need you to help explain that to me. Why am I hearing concerns about the people living there not getting sufficient services why am I hearing things from people saying that it may not be uh, a stable group of people, people that need more needs? And why am I hearing otherwise from the, proponent, um, the proposed developer that, no, there's no problems. It's fine. It, you don't have anything to worry about. And, and also, you know, other people in town. It's low-income housing. It's fine. You're, you're, there's something wrong with you. I want to know why those two things are so different so that I can feel comfortable with it. So that's where I'm coming from. And um, we're concerned as a neighborhood that we haven't really had our own opportunity to present all of our information to you like Valley CDC has. And I do want you to know that I have a copy here of the Fishbowl and Dynamic Facilitation Model and it's set up so that Valley CDC, Valley CDC presents the scope and plans for their SRO. So they do have a presentation time. And then we are amidst this fishbowl concept. But we still have never had a chance as a neighborhood to present a lot of careful research and data and sort of see how it all adds up or where it doesn't add up and get answers to the questions. Because we want to be, we want to be able to be comfortable with the project. Thank you. Thank you. And you'll be able to come on June 18th? With no, okay. Um, any other public comment? Yes, please. Uh, I'm sorry, you'll have to come up. You have to come to the mic. Yep. I'm sure I'm late because I actually had an interview at the North Shore apartment. Oh, nice. Um, so I just sit down and press. It's usually nice to know what the the gist is before I tailor uh, my comment. Yeah. But Can I you identify your... Press the little button. It's on. I think it's on. That's oh, there right. you go. Okay. And so you'll have to identify yourself. I'm sorry. I, I always like to hear what is being spoken before myself before I, so I tailor my comment specifically. So I really had to choose between being late. Can you give us your name? What now? Your, your name. name. My name is Jerry. People call me Wave. And I guess, you know, I'm going to just speak to the last persons, and, and uh, as someone who's been searching extremely hard for housing with a voucher, I understand the need. However, I absolutely understand everyone's concerns because I did a sublet that was from Amherst Community Connections. I gotta say that was a hindrance going there, and I felt highly abused, and I realized that I did not follow the protocol, which was go, what I'm gonna call, quietly into the to slaughter, which would be at the apartments. And what I have wondered is, I would say, how can these places pass inspection? Yeah. Number one, I saw how they didn't dent and I had to challenge it. Number two, I have pictures, which no one could believe. Only one person I got to come and actually smell this. So my concern is, is you know, there's a good way to do things in a wrong way, but it was actually b better in my car. It was essentially a, a, a bathroom, and that was the only usable thing. And as far as, it seemed like that people who were low income were supposed to basically be shuttled, no questions asked, into not only certain apartments, but certain units that could therefore never, they would never have to actually get them to the most basic codes, let alone. And basically it was pretty clear that if you lived there and you weren't someone who was mentally ill or drunk or totally dysfunctional and dared to even question that, you would probably be with a bad reference and be stuck there forever. It was also an incredibly expensive place. And so I really feel that there needs to, 
I'm not a person of oversight. However, these units had literally no what I consider actual oversight in the condition, let alone the actual what was going on there. So people are being asked to choose, like people said, oh, if you don't go there where you're there, you have to, you will lose your voucher. And I was like, well, the only meal left is poison that actually could ruin my life or put me in the same situation with fraud or bad things that have nothing to do with my lifestyle. That would not be a smart choice. Mm -hmm. And I realized that, you know, it would be helpful with housing authority could do room shares because a place like that, it's like sharing a house with people you didn't choose. And people say, well, all the drunks have a right to live somewhere, but so do other people. Yeah. Other people who need to actually focus or have a, might be low income, but have high standards. Mm -hmm. and even, I've been low income, but I've never lived in squalor or dysfunction or been accosted on a daily basis by people screaming at me, yelling at me, give me this, give me that, key in my car. I mean, it's virtually impossible to live your own life. I call it rehab gone awry or basically a satellite of a mental institution. Yes, those people need, I think that there should be like dorms, like there's the cigarette butt, nip bottle, totally dysfunction, nutty complex, and then the sustainable <laughs> complex where people want to actually, pride of ownership or tenantship. I mean, if this thing was, was work or owned, I mean, like I, if it was my place, I would have pounded all the nails that were sticking in, perhaps hired someone to actually walk. I mean, this is why I took pictures, because no one was interested. And I was not interested in exposing any of that. I was just interested in actually getting the most basic, even if it's rustic, housing that, that was not worse than no housing. Mm -hmm. So I think people's concerns are very valid, and I think uh, on both sides. But I do see how what a pattern had become where the agency after agency dropped off people who literally, for even the management said there are people who should not be here living alone for various reasons, have no idea that you have to throw out trash. And it, so you're at the mercy and risk of people who live very close to you, whether you're a neighbor or a shared wall. Mm -hmm. One guy, no, and there's no, no, I don't slap on the wrist. Like one guy, he said, oh, I fell in the pond. I went on purpose on the ice. I've done it four times. And someone else said, oh, that's the guy who started four fires. So it seems like the housing authority, the vouchers, as well as ACC perhaps is essentially subsidizing a huge amount of alcoholics and really problem people with, and there's no, like saying, if you're gonna get this, maybe you have to have some standard or get help or, you know, and if you're actually on the other side of it, you re get retaliated because you're supposed to be in that group and that's how we rent these units and that's how we all make money to keep these units for the worst people. So don't let that happen. I heard CDC probably does a better job. I don't know, mm -hmm. but thank you. Thank you. Jerry, thank you. Great. first of all, first of all, it's good to see you, not just on Friday. Um, uh, I want to say that the SROs are individual studio apartments. They're going to be brand new. Um, I think that what you're talking about in terms of vouchers that, and where you're being sent to housing that is substandard is not what this project is about. And in fact, this project is trying to address that so that the people who live there, whether they are people who have been homeless, people who have been addicted, or people who are working in downtown restaurants, um, uh, or service positions have a really nice place to live and a community that can develop. There will be on-site management and et cetera, et cetera. So thank you for your comments. Thank you. It, yeah, Dorothy. Well, that's coming to the bone of contention. We have not received sufficient information on what many people regard as basic on-site management. Uh, all that we've heard is 20 hours, and I don't know whether it's one person or 20 hours between a variety of service providers who will have hours in the office. And um, I think that, um, I think you're right. It's great. These are going to be brand new. They're going to be clean. Um, there's going to be uh, a nice piece of property around it. There are going to be community g gardens where people can garden. There are a lot of positive aspects of this plan. But I feel that if there is not an assurance of more supervision, that it will not succeed. And that is where I'm having a problem. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, come on forward, and then uh, 
Dave Zomek has a, come on, you can sit. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I just want to insert that um, in the future, it might be good if, although this is a very fruitful conversation, um, I am conscious of the fact that the committee um, has a limited amount of time, yep. and typically public comment has some limits in terms of yep. time, so I just want to be yeah, yeah. careful of that, and that there will be multiple opportunities yep. on the 18th, on future council meetings, um, to discuss this. So I just, I know you have a full agenda. So, so with the permission of the council, I think that this is an important issue that is, um, you know, extended play might be worth, because it covers many issues, housing, master plan, you know. I will be brief, Hallie Hughes, 30 Orchard Street. I actually wanted to address something Councillor Pam first said that she didn't know where the property was, and I'm the crazy lady that sent an email inviting you all for a walking tour on Sunday, so I would encourage Councillor, everyone yeah. to come, and I promise I won't be talking a lot of politics. I just want to actually just give you a feel for where things are and where the neighborhood is. Yeah. And um, I was one of the three community members that went to Kate Trost's house to meet with Valley CDC, and actually it was the third time I'd asked them directly about, I know that there's a six-month sobriety requirement to get into the house, but I've been asking what happens when you get into the community, and so this addresses what the woman before me said too, and I thought I'd clarify what um, another question Councillor Pam had, which was the six-month sobriety is large, from, this is coming from Valley CDC, the way I heard it is largely self-reported or it is a clinician's letter stating that they, are sobri that they are sober for at least six months going in, but there's no demonstration of attending a program or anything. It is, however, a um, wet house in that alcohol and marijuana or whatever is legal is allowed once you are there. Jeff. Thank you. Okay, no more public comment? No? Okay, so why don't we keep moving? On to, yep. Is Jerry still here or did she leave? Okay, Jerry, I'm just very glad you called me up and spoke to me, and I'm so glad to see that you came here today because I felt you were bringing some really in, important information um, about the management of the low-income houses or the places where you, people can go with a voucher, and I think that's something that we will want to be following up on even beyond this particular project. That. You know, I, I'm sorry, you'll have to come to the mic if, you know, you'll have to, okay, come forward. I just realized that the only, the outside world only has. I'm just hoping voice. that there is a place where it, it, you don't need monitoring. I mean, in other words, it has adult, adults, not children, you know, adults who are drunk all day or something. There's various levels of problems. Some people are not causing their own problems, but however, it would be nice to, be in a place where it doesn't need a babysitter, where people cooperatively work together and don't need monitoring yeah. per se. Thank you. So, pardon me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're gonna move on to uh, goals. So you'll recall that we had been working on the goals, so the goals of the council We had been looking at that and looking at those parts that were delegated to us, and then I had volunteered to alter the doc or to add comments to the document for our feedback. And as I got started on it, I realized I had no idea what I was doing. So I asked Lynn for some guidance, and I think she just sent an example document to us, and I still am not exactly sure how to fill out this form. But I do think it's worth, you know, now that we have been in existence for almost two months, I do think it's worth 
taking another look at what we think we can accomplish, you know, in relationship to these goals and seeing if these dates are realistic. So if it's okay, um, I'd like to go back through that whole list and, you know, talk about what we think we can accomplish this year, what we can think we can accomplish, you know, next year and uh, give that feedback back to, to Lynn and to the rest of the council. This, so I believe that she just sent this by email okay. to us, and it's called Examples for Your Meeting. So if you can open up your email, it'll, it'll be there. Do you, do you see it? Do you, you have it open? Everyone have it open? Or do you have it, Dave? Steve, would you send it to yep. me? I'm not sure I'm copied on it. I don't think you are. I feel left out. Yeah. Oh. Just... I, I'm just about to do that. Oh, so. you could do that, can't you? I'm, I'm going to do it right now. Hold on one sec. Access to the chairs, please. Okay. Okay, so uh, Mr. Sign, yes. Okay. All right. So this leave this is, page. This is the, the, the first time I've been in a meeting where a document is sent to us during the meeting that yeah. we have to act on. So, um, Yeah, so let me just talk conceptually for a second. And I need to talk, sort of think about this out loud. So there's, uh, there's a hundred different things that we can be doing, right? So we have everything from roads to sidewalks. Um, we have things that are referred to us. We have things that we know we want to, to address. Um, we just went through a presentation with the zoning subcommittee about some pent up zoning bylaw changes that they're proposing. So I think it's really important for us to prioritize what we think we can do. So rather than trying, to, in, in a way the goals already is doing that for us because it does spread it out over time. But I think we need to, um, you know, really think about what's, what our highest priorities. Yeah, so you have much more color than those. I, I, this is not, can't be a document. No, it is, yeah. But yours has many more comments than mine. Yeah, I don't even know where to start. Yeah, we'll start at the top. So, um, yep. And so I'm starting at an, it says Amherst Town Council Goals Worksheet Draft draft as of 418. Yeah. And this one is March for bylaw review. That's why yep. it's such a mess. Yep. Yeah. What we need to do is look for the responsible parties and committees yep. to the CRC. Exactly. Okay. So what I'd like to do is go back down through that. And so I'm starting. Hmm. I bet that the first time I took it down, it was my back to me. The problem, one of the problems with this is that sometimes things are assigned to multiple committees. Yeah. So if the other committee thinks it's very doable and we don't, then I'm not sure how that gets. Yeah. So who? Yep. So I see that, that it seems to be the first reference to the CRC and the responsible party. So it is something that falls to the town manager to negotiate that with the university. And I know that um, he is planning to bring that to the full council at the appropriate time. I don't think there's a date certain for that. Okay, so that would then affect whether we want to place him in the permit. I'm sorry, thank you, Andrew whether we are want to use uh, June 2019 or do we want to extend that date, Andy? Well, that box says um, target date to begin end. I think we're talking about begin, not end. Uh, and, uh, I, I think we need to think about the end piece. That's much more serious. Yeah. But the thing is, is that uh, we don't, the end date for um, the strategic partnership agreement 
will be based upon when a draft is available, which is really something that is a matter of discussion that takes place between the town manager and uh, the, the, the counterparts at the university. So uh, once he has a draft, then it would seem that what our ideal goal would be a presentation and full discussion at this committee, mm -hmm. an opportunity if we choose to meet with other people who we may find would be helpful to us to, to, to further the conversation at that time and uh, that we uh, then make a recommendation based upon our uh, investigation of it to the full council prior to a council vote. But I don't think we can put times timelines on that because we don't really control when it will become available to us. Um, yep. I have a comment on that. I, I remember when I raised this that I was told that really this was not something that we do, that the town manager does it. Um, but I think that uh, Andy's right. We will look over it. We will comment on it. But today, um, some people who came to my office hour mentioned that there was another town gown group. It wasn't the strategic partnership, which deals with money um, and legal things, um, but it was a town gown um, committee uh, made up of a lot of people that live in my district, um, and that it was dissolved by the university about the time that the public-private partnership uh, new dormitory was begun, a discussion was begun on. And, um, and again, what we hear may not be exactly what is going on, but the latest word was that the university plans to build the new thousand bed dormitory in the parking lots at the top of Lincoln, which is the university's property. So, you know, that's something they can do. But that um, in addition to the strategic partnership, which the town manager negotiates and we will look at and review, I think that we also, also should be involved in um, a, a less formal town gown um, thing in which we try to talk uh, or in some way mediate or encourage for there to be this kind of relationship that used to exist for, this, for it to be revived and that we should at least know what's going on. So I think that's an excellent point that the P3 is a new form of collaboration, um, possibly taxable, <laughs> that the, does require the cooperation with the town and, or should require the, so whether or not zoning is exempt just because they own the land for for, that's an unsettled issue, right? As to whether or not, um, if they're engaging private developers on public land, whether or not they're still exempt from zoning. But, but I think that in, well, at least in the spirit of, at least in the, the spirit of partnership, I think that this would be something to, but go ahead. You yeah, know, there's a lot of, yeah. a lot of questions and, and topics in there. I just, maybe I can back out to something Dorothy said earlier. So, so there's the strategic partnership agreement, which is typically a three-year agreement that the town negotiates with the university that squarely falls in Mr. Bockelman's uh, uh, authority, but, and I would defer to him and, and your president to um, decide when that would come to the council and the CRC. I think you were referring to UTAC earlier, yeah. the yeah. University yeah. Town of Amherst Collaborative, mm -hmm. which was a, um, a group of people and an agreement that came out of uh, a larger group that we started some years ago called the Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods Working Group, which was a, 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 a collaborative effort uh, between residents, the town, and the university to look at quality of life issues in the neighborhood. And it was about, there must have been almost 20 people and we met right in this room for a couple of years. Out of that group came a recommendation for the rental registration right. bylaw mm -hmm. and a lot of other good recommendations. So from that um, came the rental registration program, which we now have, which calls for um, 
um, uh, voluntary uh, uh, self-certification of all rental units in, in town. And lots of other good things came out of that. So fast forward, and we created also out of that UTAC, the University of Town of Amherst Collaborative, mm -hmm. um, which was a group of citizens, business owners, you're right, some folks in, in the neighborhoods that you represent, in the district you represent, Dorothy. Um, and to be accurate, it wasn't really the university that disbanded that, uh, although you may have heard that. Um, I think what we really did was kind of put a pause on that and say, it may have ran its course in its current form, mm -hmm. but that there might be a new way to think about it. Okay. So I think that's consistent with what the two of you, you and Steve just yeah. talked about is, um, that was a good group, it was beneficial, mm -hmm. a lot of good things came out of it, great communication between the town and the university. Now also out of some of that work came um, some target areas that the university uh, could develop for housing, one of them being off of Massachusetts Ave mm -hmm. uh, on the uh, south side of Mass Ave uh, as Mass Ave cuts right through, through their campus. So um, that has been public, that the university is seeking a, a public-private partnership to develop uh, a certain number of beds on Mass Ave. And I don't have an update on where that, that um, RF uh, P is right now, but I know the university is proceeding along those lines. Um, so I think we could certainly explore the idea of what comes after UTAC, mm -hmm. um, and that's something we could look at. But yeah, go ahead. Well, the, the, the comment of the people today, homeowners who live right next to that, is that their lovely house uh, and gardens, it would be in a way trapped between what we assume has to be a high rise because the lot's not that big and a thousand beds is a lot of beds. Um, and Fearing Street, which is still a very lively corridor for students partying, um, mostly um, in the evening. Um, and the feeling was that perhaps the aim is to just basically have the homeowners give up and leave, therefore, moving the university deeper into the neighborhood. And, um, you know, I represent people who want to hold the line. So we talked about what can we do, because the university owns the land. And um, besides a group talking to us, um, there were, you know, thoughts that um, certainly there could be maybe a, a large tree belt between the dorm and the residential street, which would be something And I don't mean to interrupt, interest. but but let's, um, I think that having a, you know, certainly a priority of, of whatever we can do to look at what's proposed. I was just gonna say that maybe to put that in the, right. the sort of job at hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Right. yeah. Yes, but I do, I do think that we should add, you know, just to remind ourselves that the, that, that the, because um, this is the bold higher education maintain and strengthen relationship that paying attention to the P3 is critical, and the CRC is the most obvious group. And so we, could, we could certainly have a, that be a future agenda item yep. with perhaps even somebody from the university yep. coming and giving you all a presentation on yep. what is planned. Yep, okay. so I'm gonna put that, go ahead. Yeah. The only other thing for everybody is that uh, if you look on the town website under the section that's uh, across the banner at the top living. There's a whole section below that on the University of Town of Amherst Collaborative, also known as UTAC, and it explains a little bit of the history of it there, and uh, Mr. Zomek's very important role in that. Uh, okay, that was easy. Um, no, I'm <laughs> So page nine, I'm gonna add with your permission, um, commentary about the, the P3 and, you know, a start date sometime soon to have a presentation about that. So I'm gonna move on, move us on to page, the next time the CRC appears. I'm on page 12, I'm on page 13, 14. Anyone? Okay, master plan. 
from on page 15. So this is master plan review and if necessary, advise and then adopt a master plan. CRC and planning board. So some of this we've done. So we have done our initial review of master plan and Presentation and discussion of master plan at a special town council meeting that includes others. So that was planned for fall of 2019, and this would be a special town council meeting. I think that that seems doable and important. So just because not everyone is, you know, just the more familiar we can make ourselves with the existing master plan, I think is a good idea. Um, and then there's a bunch of other things things, develop and begin implementation of a plan to review, revise, and adopt the master plan. So I, I think that um, the, so many, there being so many things on the plate of the CRC and the town council, I think this idea that we would, you know, start this year on revising the master plan or seems like a stretch, but I think making us more knowledgeable about what the strength of the master plan is and where some of the gaps might be, I do think it's important. And I think that, you know, looking at this schedule, which really is sort of considering updating or not, seems like it's workable, because this is really a one-year process. Two-year two process, because it relates summer of, um, till the summer of 2021. Actually, even later, town council adopts master plan fall of 2021, so that's two years. To me, that seems like a doable yeah. plan. Yeah. yeah. It's so really because we're planning on the master plan. Yeah. yeah. Um, can can we ask you to make I, this is very interesting, but very amorphous and large. I I feel that I'd be much happier if it were broken down into small pieces. Yep. And I'm just wondering, can you do that with your experience on the planning board? Um, look through it and put it into reasonable chunks so that we know what we're dealing with on which meeting, and we would come all having read the same pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That as we get more into this. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, oh, yeah. because otherwise it's just awfully vague and amorphous. Yeah. And we can say, oh, we did that, but we really didn't do it. We did I, not, but we did do an important first step, which was the introduction to the, yeah. actually we've had two. So we had yeah. one that when we were a brand new council and now another one um, when we were a brand new CRC. Yeah, so it does seem like this is an overview and what I hear you asking for Dorothy is a more direct view for us as a committee. Yes, yes, yes and I agree committee. wholeheartedly. Yep. And I'll definitely, as we get into this, so this is really starting in the fall. Right. So I, I definitely will volunteer to work with the appropriate people from Dave's unit to kind of um, make it easier to understand. So I'm moving into chunks. Into chunks. I, I, um, I'm going to move us on to page 17, which is zoning. Yeah, before you go, oh, on, I'm sorry. There's several things that I was curious about or observed. One is, is that uh, there's reference on page 15 to a CRC master plan working group. And, and uh, we've not really talked about what that working group is and how that is created and what its role is, its responsibilities, and how it relates to the entire group. Does it include more members um, than just members of the committee itself? Are there other counselors or other non-counselors, other staff involved? So I think that that needs to be understood um, as a part of the process. Another piece, and this was referred to by Ms. Brestrip when she was here, that um, it is common 
for this kind of complex process to uh, have some consultant assistance available who have expert, uh, with expertise in helping communities to uh, develop master plans and involve the public in the discussion of what the primary goals are in the master plan, that gets into uh, budgetary issues. I know that we had some discussion, but I can't now go back in the, in the get distracted from the meeting to go looking for where it fits in with the uh, uh, capital plan, the long-term capital plan. It is in there, uh, but uh, 2021. Yeah. So uh, you know, all of these things, um, you know, have the the budget piece has to fit with the end result, and uh, you know, the other, I guess, the last piece is once the uh, consultant has helped us through a process, um, it still needs time to uh, work through both the, uh, to the planning board and the council in some order. And we need to make sure that we understand what each group's role is because they're both um, charter provisions that speak to that, but they're also state law provisions that speak to that. So, so the normal shelf life of a master plan is 20 years. So, and then, but, um, is that an MG master general law or is it just a rule of thumb? So, so, so 20 years is rule a typical. Of thumb. Yeah, typical. So our master plan actually has built into it, it shall be looked at and updated every five years. So now we're in the 10th year, and we really haven't gone through that process of updating it, because that is a collaborate. I mean, that would be generated by the planning board. And so. Th yeah, and this, it could be the CRC working group, could be the CRC. So we haven't defined a CRC working group. Somebody else, I didn't know what that stood for, thank you. So I ignored that because I thought that's not us. I just looked at the CRC part. Yeah. So I, I uh, so yeah, so we should have been doing that over the last 10 years of the master plan of, of looking at it and updating it. And I think it's been done sort of informally, but there hasn't been really a formal process for, for updating. So this is, you know, this is our shot to do the updates. So the, uh, the question, so the charter is, says that something like the council shall, if there's a, the council shall adopt the master plan. So it's silent on, is that a new master plan? Is that the existing master plan? What do we mean by adopt? But, and I'm sorry, you, you, someone had their hand up earlier. Yeah, but I was, I was the, only thing I was, the only thing I was pointing out is, is that um, just using the, mass, the, the word processing document itself, it, um, the CRCMP suggestion was made by a member of the council is an insertion. Okay. And uh, Ms. Brewer had made that rec uh, suggestion. And uh, yeah. so, but, it, but it's a, it, I think that we should take up the suggestion yep. whether it's something that we think um, is important and how we would want to structure that. That's really a committee goal. Um, yeah, I would like to hear what you think, um, to kind of pick the brains of you two, having more experience, what you think a working group of that sort could be. Not that we have to establish it, but kind of like what, to, what it could be. Andy. <laughs> There have been various kinds of working groups depending upon what seems most appropriate. I think about things like um, the working group that um, worked with the town manager on development of policies around marijuana regulation after uh, the voters passed the initiative. And uh, there was members of the select board, which, of which I was not one of them, a couple of members of the select board. Uh, there was uh, representatives of various town departments 
and I frankly don't know who else was involved. It was a fairly large group. There may have been some uh, from some community members. I would really have to go back to somebody like Ms. Kruger, and who was much more involved with it to ask how it was structured. Um, I know that, for example, Mr. Kravitz played a very large role in that, um, as uh, in his role as the um, economic development uh, director for the town, and plus his legal background. Um, I think what we would need to do is think through that kind of a group which could involve members of the in, undoubtedly would involve members of the council this com or in this committee in particular, we could involve appropriate members of the staff, could involve uh, people from the planning board directly in the process. Uh, but uh, I think we, it, it's really up to us to create one that seems mm -hmm. right for the process that we un under are undertaking. And, uh, I would certainly look yeah. to Mr. Zomek and Ms. Brustrup to give us some guidance on that from their experience in developing the prior plan. So in a way, the question is, what kind of sandpaper should you buy at the hardware store? Because we, but the problem is we don't know, um, as we take a deep dive into this, how many things we see as issues that need to be updated. So I took a very cursory look from a, perspective of someone that hadn't looked at it in a long time. And I said, oh, this paragraph could be changed or this could be updated. But really that it's, so that, but that's just my one opinion. And others could see structural, you know, huge structural problems that involve entire rewrites of chapters. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, of course, the nuclear option is rewriting the whole thing. So, <laughs> I, I guess I personally envision something like the bylaw review committee, which is committee of six, mm -hmm. five or six, something like that, which could do, um, you know, I don't want to say quick, but like a six month, you know, multiple, multi multi yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, committee of five. So that, that's what I was seeing, but they could come to places where there really needs to be a rewrite. Yeah, and I don't know about that yet, but uh, through my reading over time in the last minutes of the master plan, it seemed there was a structure there that could be carried forward, could be yep. changed, that it was a solid structure. Um, it is um, important to me that we have residents um, yep. on this uh, work in the working group. Um, and again, I'll say not just professional residents who are architects and stuff, because we can, we have an abundance of that, but also people from different areas of the community who can clue us in um, to things we're less yep. aware of because of our privilege. Yep. I think that sounds good. I, I do think that we want to look and see if there are some areas that we might want to rethink. Um, yeah. But I, the idea of building a whole new one is really just too upsetting to think about. Um, <laughs> I think we, it's, it's, it's enough if we kind of rework some major areas and fix little things that seem, seem to be out of date or need yeah, fixing. Yeah. Speak, so this is a great conversation and I'm not going to comment on everything, but I, I'm enjoying the conversation. I think there's a lot there. Um, yeah, how much is enough? I think. That's going to be the question, and so this idea of a working group sounds very interesting. Um, there's lots of examples of where the town has, uh, either the select board or the town manager has appointed people for a distinct period of time to accomplish a goal. This is not a committee or a, a group that would stay together indefinitely, but they would have a charge and they would work on this project for this period of time. I think the key for me would be to Pat's point how we want there to be broad involvement from the community and that's the thing that takes more time energy staff time um, I will say that many communities do bring in a third party expert for a variety of reasons one is to be a multiplier for staff because we do have a finite number of staff members and they're typically maxed out 
but two is to bring their expertise from out there, from other communities. What have other communities done and how have they been successful? And it, these consultants work with communities all over Massachusetts, all over New England, and we would likely select one with experience in communities like Amherst. So they bring a really unique perspective often, which is, which is wonderful. The one bit of, and, and I know we're gonna transition into other things in a minute, but the one thing I'm thinking of too is, again, priorities and workload, both for you, yeah. staff, my staff, because we have the master plan piece, and then we're gonna talk in a few minutes, I think, about, about zoning. So these are two really big topics and so, are very time consuming for you as council members and members of the CRC and for staff. So how we sequence these, because there are, relation, there are connections, clear connections between the two as well. But I think in terms of workload, we need to think about that. Um, I know that um, the charter calls for one, every year the council needs to hold a meeting on the master plan. So between now and December 31st, we need to hold a meeting on the master plan. Um, I believe that's in the charter. So that might be a good, I think somebody referenced earlier, a kickoff to this process that might be longer in duration of updating, well hopefully, I don't wanna put words in your mouth, I think of it as an update to the master plan. I agree with Dorothy, the idea of throwing the whole thing out and starting from scratch is, a, is quite daunting. And I think the master plan by and large is a very good document. Um, I think the implementation sections need work. And as Steve said, there are, there are various sections that need updating. It's, it's been a while, 2010. So those are my quick comments. Yeah. I'm sorry, Kate, you. Go, come on, come on. We're, we're, we're allowed to be creative for the new rules of the. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, as in a community resident, I encourage you to see if you can get a representative of each of the academic institutions actively working with you on the master plan insofar as you have the developments that are changing on their campuses and their master plans as part of your knowledge base. Because the, the, what, we, what Dorothy was referring to earlier today, that um, 1,000 bed uh, building, it's a big impact on the neighborhood. I see parking overflow all the time in the downtown neighborhoods, both from UMass and, and Amherst College when they renovated their field. I don't know if they're under the, uh, I don't know if they have to have their plans reviewed in the way other developments happen here in town. They don't. But then the consequences of the way they do their developments overflow into the neighborhood streets. So we have such large universities. I don't even think you necessarily can find a consultant that could find a model of a town exactly like ours with all that experience. We're kind of like forging new territory here with such large uh, university populations and changes going on all the time. It's very dynamic. That's Mansell, my... Mansell, I mean, there aren't others in Massachusetts because we're the flagship in a... So, so what I'd love to see, my, because I I'm also work at UMass, and I'm also in, involved in planning issues at UMass, um, I would love to see a consolidated master plan where 01002 and 01003 are, there's a, you know, a single document because those are two almost equally sized entities that you know, UMass plans right up to its borders and Amherst um, plans, big, UMass is shown almost like a gray area because it's not under the control of the town and then vice versa. So that, was, that has been one of the goals of the town gown committee. So one of the, because I was on the very original, original town gown committee and that was one of the goals is to bring together the two master plans, the U3 consultants. Um, and the, the focus was really on the, that edge area where the town and the gown meet each other. So, and actually a lot of it came out of the, you know, the gateway project, which was to be a town gown collaboration. 
So, but that's the history there. So I, I think it's a really good point about, so the UMass has a campus planning committee. The planning director is actually ex officio a member of that committee. And I don't know if the reverse is true, like our zoning subcommittee, if it made sense to have someone for UMass or, but I think it's a, it's a good point. Um, so, in, in, uh, in reference to Dave's comments, if we have an expert and if there's a working group, and let's just say that um, at this moment I would say, oh, I'd love to be on that working group. But let's say that it turns out that I'm not on that working group and that most of us are not on that working group. I mean, I don't quite know how this would be done. What I would want to make sure that we do before anything is turned over to experts is that we have a really deep visioning experience. I don't mean session, I don't mean one meeting, but that we really get a chance to talk about what we see, what we see in the future, what we hope will happen, what we hope will not happen, how we see the town of Amherst. Um, so that if we don't be the ones who are putting in the exact language in the revised master plan, that we affect the vision of it. Is, yep. is that possible? Is that a rhetorical question? Yeah. Or? No, actually, I want to know if Andy thinks it's so. Yeah, I think basically, as I say, this committee needs to be thinking about it and thinking create, creatively. I don't think we have a specific model to go from. We right. have to come up with what works right for us. We'll come into some practical questions like how many members of this committee should be involved with it because if you get a majority of the committee, then um, you get some um, legal questions that fall out of that. Um, but, you know, those are things we should think about. I don't think we need to answer them today. Our goal is today is to come up with a work plan and maybe um, this is a high up item on the work plan order is uh, suggesting a working group format. Great idea. Um, let's keep moving. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, Councillor Shane. Yeah, exactly. I Yes, Kathy and Shane, your address, your address. member of the public, but also member of the Rules uh, Procedure Committee where we wrote in work group. And I just want to remind you, it's a, it's a work group of the council, you know, that it can be created any way you want, to, we want to as a council. So it's not asking the town manager to form one, it's asking us to form one. So I just, I just wanted to bring it back. It, I mean, we, we can get any advice too, but we, uh, wrestled with what it is, and it's not a decision-making entity. It comes back having thought through things and comes back. Um, so it's, it's a creative idea that we found in several other towns that when they had something that wasn't a quick discussion, and it did involve residents, it wasn't just council members. So, so yeah, so we have to work out what this thing is, but the thing, the idea was it enabled us to wrestle with more complex issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, my computer, so we're on page, I see it, I, I'm back up to date. My computer likes to crash. So we're, we're, we're gonna move on to zoning, which is on page, yeah, so page 17. So uh, zoning review, assess, revise zoning bylaws. So in a way, the, so the order of this is this kind of suggesting the macro down to the micro or, or so the zoning bylaw is supposed to relate to the, the master plan. So when we met with the zoning subcommittee, they had um, introduced a whole bunch of ideas from the very specific, should there be three votes instead of four votes on site plan reviews, to the macro, should there be a new zoning bylaw. 
So I think that they, in particular, they introduced three different ideas that they thought were sort of the bunny slope of, you know, getting started on helping the, you know, helping to see how this new process might work. So I'm actually going to go to the zoning subcommittee meeting this afternoon at five and, and kind of talk through that also. But um, in some ways, so since the zoning bylaw is the actual bylaw, the master plan is sort of the guiding principles of the town, but the zoning bylaw basically puts the rubber to the road. So that is the bridge document that helps deal with a lot of land use issues. That this, it has to be related to the master plan. This is how we see it's related. This is how it should be interpreted. In some ways, I think dealing with the zoning bylaw is, for me, more of a priority because I think that there are glitches in the zoning bylaw. If you think about what we all discussed during the campaigns, much of it had to do with zoning and land use. Mm -hmm. So I personally would put this as, you know, almost a higher priority than, you know, the master plan. So I think the master plan is, is a solid document. I think that we need to do, do we need to do due diligence on that. But to me, I think that some of the issues in the zoning bylaw are, will really affect the look and feel of the town. So that said, um, I'm on the thing that says zoning review assess. So, yeah. So spring 2019, this is spring 2019 still, we've started. So I'm on the second present presentation discussion of master plan and zoning 101. We essentially have done that. Conduct field trips around town. I'm all for field trips, but I'm not positive where we need that right at the moment. Um, summer of 2019. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Thank you, Dorothy. One of the things I'm wondering is what is the process we're going to be doing uh, with the master plan, with transportation, with housing, with the zoning bylaws? Because, you know, I mean, we're talking about working that through during the retreat and stuff. But if there, I guess I keep thinking, well, this seems overwhelming, but it wouldn't be if we had a process. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I really struggle with this one, too, because I think, in a way, we need real things. So in other words, we could have, we could, like, we have some real things, like 132 Northampton is, you know, a real tangible issue, and which is causing us to, you know, figure out what our process could, you know, could be. Um, public arts, things that are being referred to us, like the public art, by law. So in some ways, how do I say this? Um, like the three things the zoning subcommittee is proposing that we might want to take action on or that we might want to, they're actually holding public hearings on some of these. That that would be a, 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 a chance for us to see how we would process something like that. So that would be, so in a way I, what I would love to do is to go through something like that, you know, go through real steps of how we review a zoning bylaw that's being proposed before we try to determine what our process is. It sounds a little backwards, but otherwise. So I, I have a perfect example. Um, some, we have downtown um, anchoring an area uh, on East Pleasant Street, and we're told that the demolition, or there's a hearing mm. on the demolition, will go on. And my thought is, okay, I don't own any of this land, but somebody knows who owns it. Is there any way for us or somebody to sit down with the people who own the land and say, can we have a plan? Can we have a coordinated plan? Um, what zoning laws do we have in place that would aid or that would hinder this? I mean, if you talk about real life exercise, we're in the middle of one right now. Um, or do we just let it happen? Because I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know who has any power or what rules apply. Yeah. So let's take that as a case study. So we all read in the Gazette that, um, or at least I read in the Gazette that 
about this possible demolition of those three buildings. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what is the council's role in that? Yeah. So the council's role is, so we're the legislative branch, so we're the law, we pass laws, right? So that's basically what, we set the budget, we pass laws, we have, evaluate the town manager, I forget, a, a few things like that. So we don't get directly involved in, like we don't police the streets, we don't um, write tickets. So that's left to either the permitting bodies or to the executive branch. So when I read that, what I read was do our, you know, are the laws governing the historic commission that created and governed the rules at the historic commission, are those the appropriate laws? Assuming that there will be a new building or buildings presented, or proposed for that, are the laws that are in our right, purview, right. are those the right laws? Yeah, exactly. So so rather than, um, but I, I do see a certain urgency. So the master plan is kind of irrelevant to what mm -hmm. may or may not happen to that land because it's the laws that are, you know, govern that. So that's why I see this mm -hmm. as almost a more urgent um, yeah, I, I exercise. Agree. Yeah. Does, does that help at all? But it does. I mean, we'll obviously learn a lot, but whatever happens is going to be there for a long time. So I'm, I'm hoping that we yeah. can learn and we can yeah. see are the laws appropriate. Let's say we find out our laws are not appropriate to do something that we all agree should be done. We can't change them in time to do it. So, I mean, it's, it's going to be a great learning exercise, and yeah. I look forward to you helping lead us through it but I hope that we can also influence to the good yep. in some way, or that some other part of the town can influence to the good. Okay. And influencing to the good, my only concern with that is we might have different definitions what of good. good? Right. And that feels what's powerful about this committee is that we're gonna be looking at impacts and trying to do that neutrally. So in a certain way, it's letting go of whether I want that building mm -hmm. there um, and right. um, seeing, is my position really supported by what we discover, or do, or is it actually more beneficial than we thought? But in what ways, so we can speak to that? Yeah. Yeah, Dave. So again, this is a continuation of a great conversation, and I'm enjoying every minute of it. <laughs> um, a couple of quick comments. One is, I, you know, I do agree with Steve that. Um, there are a number of possible uh, real world examples in our community that might be um, helpful for the CRC and perhaps other members of the council to understand in more detail. Um, the article on the area near the, the current pub uh, in those buildings um, is one such example. Without going into detail right now, I can assure the CRC and the council that there is a very well established, very rigorous process that anyone would does need to go through in order to demolish a structure or multiple structures in our downtown. I will say that, just going back to a minute, something Steve said, I do think any vision that the current owners or a future owner have for that property is informed by the master plan. Because, and again, we need to recognize that the master plan is a broad document. But it's been said many times before, and I think it's worth saying again, the master plan spoke to densifying village centers. Mm -hmm. That's where we want the growth to go. We can disagree about how high the growth is or how wide the growth is or what architecture the growth comes with, but that's what we said we wanted in that master plan. So fundamentally, if we if we don't have consensus on that as a community, that's kind of a major thing we need to look at with the master plan. But what we said 10 years ago, eight years ago, nine years ago was, we wanted growth to happen in our village centers where the zoning supported such growth, where they're on bus lines and bike paths and, and uh, transportation and shops and services, and not in outlying areas that we wanted to protect and preserve or keep as rural outlying uh, residential. So I think that's a fundamental piece. Um, and again, so I think there's a really well-established process for the owners of this property, and it might be 
interesting if we take that as a little bit of a case study for you all to bring back Rob Mora and Christine Brestrup and outline for you what that process is. Um, and I think, Steve, to your point earlier about, you know, um, um, the zoning is set on that property. So what the owners of that property can do is very well known. And we could easily have our staff come in and tell you what is possible within the zoning, the current zoning. So that, that's easy to do, and we could do that at a future meeting. So, so maybe put another way, um, any zoning bylaw change has to be related to the master plan. So I know it was said during the, the campaign that, or maybe it might even say in the charter that any zoning bylaw has to relate to the master plan. That's, there's a default state, I believe it's a state law that says that land use laws, if there is a master plan, the land use laws must relate to the master plan. So the master plan says we want density, you know, or, or whatever it says, we want infill, we want density. The zoning bylaw makes that more specific. We want five stories, four stories, whatever the number is, 60 feet, whatever, you know, 50. I don't know, I'm just making up numbers here. In some cases, there's minimum setbacks, and in other cases, there's maximum setbacks. We think that if you're building in a certain area, your building must not be more than blank because we don't want it to look like, you know, we want Hadley Mall, or, you know, or, or something. <laughs> Um, actually, when we were looking at form-based zoning, there were also sort of minimum sizes, like you shall not build less than blank to avoid kind of the underusing or the kind of underused. And so there is no form-based zoning right now in Amherst, but that, you know, that is certainly something that we've talked about, you know, looking at also. Yeah. Steve, I think the other thing just to mention is that as we look at if you remember in the, uh, when uh, Greg Stutzman did his, his wonderful overview of this uh, uh, zoning, pri zoning issues priorities 2019, um, we also talked about kind of what are the zoning, I think Steve referenced this earlier, what are the zoning subcommittee's priorities on this? I think they're currently working on three. I think to be respectful to the zoning subcommittee, I think it would be important for you and I know that's great that Steve is going to their meeting later today to let them know, do you think their priorities are things that you and the council would want to work on this yeah. fall? Because I would hate to have them spend the next couple of months um, developing those further and spending time on them if they're really not likely to, to get traction um, moving up through the council. So I think that's something that, Steve, you can talk with the zoning subcommittee. The other thing that, you know, staff and I have talked about over the years, and I'll just plan to seed, is that um, there has, through the years, been interest, and we've seen this model work very effectively in other communities. Um, having a zoning subcommittee that is broader than just members of the planning yeah. board, and that has worked very effectively and very in a very inclusive way in many other communities in Massachusetts where we expand the membership of the zoning subcommittee beyond the planning board. And I, I'm not sure if we talked about it when they were with us, um, but having a member or two of the CRC, having a residence, having a business owner, so that we get broader perspective. Um, I have great respect for the zoning subcommittee. Um, I will say that m their meetings are not well attended and it's sad that they're not because they're so important. The work they do is so important, but they labor in this room late nights, um, many times in, by themselves, and then daylight their proposals. And it would be wonderful if we had broader participation in, in that group through, through membership and, and uh, I don't know, getting out in the community and, and seeing more how these ideas, these concepts for zoning change play out in the community? How, what do people think? Um, is that a good idea for you know, changing the zoning in this part of town or a, a amending a sign uh, by law over here to you know, impact, uh, that might impact downtown business owners or village center uh, uh, business owners, et cetera, et cetera, so without any specifics. So one thing I know we already have, but it's unfilled as a liaison to the zoning subcommittee, so they're 
historically there was a select board liaison, and I know I think that the we used to have a council liaison. So that person has not been appointed yet, but <coughs> it would make sense that it'd be somebody from this group. So that's one reason that I wanted to, and I, probably some of you <coughs> already, I don't know who already, already goes to their meetings, but that's one reason I- went I, to the last one. Did you? I'm, I'm interested yeah. in going. Oh. Um, can I ask a- Yep. Uh, this is a question to Dave. So people have talked a lot about downtown uh, to me, and we know that uh, the, the master plan calls for infill development. But some of the questions that get, uh, get asked again and again are, what can you do by right, and what do you have to get a permit to do, and how easy it seems to get a permit? So one of the questions is, are there, what are the rules for how close a building can be to the street? Um, this, the narrowness of the sidewalks in front of this new build, some of the new buildings um, is, is upsetting. And of course, if it says existing sidewalk, we know that some sidewalks are very narrow, some sidewalks are very broad. Um, is there anything, because people want a broader sidewalk, more space between the building and the street. Um, the buildings were built with no underground parking because I believe the, the dogma, and I will call it a dogma, is that we don't need to have parking with buildings, and this was in the newspaper too, in the downtown area, because there's plenty of parking, but many people say there really isn't plenty of parking. So, and also, there's nothing that says you have to have some affordable apartments in any building. The, what's gonna be built is gonna be there for a very long time, and I, I just, it's very frustrating feeling that we're on this committee and we're going to be looking at all of these things and looking at them from the impacts on people, on neighborhoods, on residents. And by the time we get ourselves organized, these new buildings will be built and may not exemplify some of the adaptations. I mean, we know there's going to be buildings. We accept that you can't, we can't change that. But just minor adjustments in how they're positioned and um, the, for the parking and whatever could make a great difference. In, in how people feel about their downtown. Yeah, let me take a stab. So the zoning bylaw has evolved. It's like a pearl. So it's evolved over time. So it's not. A, it, it, it's purposely. A, it's purposely hard to change a zoning bylaw. So it requires um, a there be a proposal, then public hearings, and I'm going to miss some steps then a recommendation by the planning board, then it goes to whether, you know, for us it was town meeting, or if city council goes to city council, then it has to be two thirds vote, then it has to be reviewed by the attorney general's office, town council's, town attorneys weighed in somewhere along the way. So lots and lots of chances for people to weigh in on the pluses, the minuses. So I think that our zoning bylaw has, you know, it's been a slow deliberative process with town meeting, because town meeting really typically only met twice per year, you know, blah, blah, blah. Oftentimes, zoning bylaws were very, very difficult to get through town meeting. So, um, it's but it's purposely meant to be slow. And so that actually is a lot of people's concerns about the new form of government, is that the process will be too quick either way. It might be too quick, you know, um, moving from four stories to 12 stories or moving from four stories to zero stories. So um, I, think, I think it's something that does require a lot of deliberation on our part. There will be efforts and lo lobbying to, to get us to change it, you, you know, in, in various ways. But I think it's something that we really need to. Yeah, but I'm sorry, someone else? A couple of things. Um, one is that uh, the charter really does create a lot of opportunity that didn't exist before, because what happened was is that the zoning subcommittee would make a proposal to the planning board, the planning board would make the proposal to town meeting. Town meeting was a big body and didn't have a committee that was working on it beforehand of the town meeting, because that's not what the nature of a town meeting is. Um, and it only met twice a year, so it had to act during the time period that it was there. 
Um, with our new procedure, it still requires two-thirds under current law, uh, two-thirds of a different body. But what we have that didn't exist before is if there was a feeling that, gee, it's close but not quite there, um, it doesn't have to go back and then take another six months to come back to the legislative body because the legislative body meets year-round. And uh, furthermore, there is this committee that has a role that we need to, to perfect so that when uh, proposals come that we have a higher level of understanding of what the planning board is thinking and can have that first round of uh, discussion with them um, and, uh, to set, and, and we need to sort of develop an understanding of what our process is in taking the recommendations and bringing them to the legislative body, which is the council of which yep. we are a committee. Um, but I, I think that there's a lot of opportunity in that. There's a lot of opportunity to do it right. And that's the real challenge that I see that is here. Uh, as far as affecting a, s a single proposal, whether it be what's uh, talked about for those three buildings on East Pleasant Street or anything else, that becomes a little bit more complicated because it depends upon when they file their um, application because the zoning law that applies is the zoning law that, that's uh, applicable at that time. So you can't, um, we, uh, as a legislative body or as a planning board, planning board can't go and change something after the application is filed because it didn't like the contents of, of the application. And uh, the ability to have um, a conversation at an early stage, I frankly would uh, look to Mr. Zomek or Ms. Brestrup for their experience as to whether that is a viable and uh, workable solution or whether it doesn't really depend upon who the owner of the property is that is seeking to develop it because my suspicion is that uh, some uh, property owners are more interested in being collaborative than others. And that, uh, but I would rely on experience of people who have to deal with it in, uh, on the ground level to, to say that with certainty. Uh, one thing I would note, uh, this is just a little point, uh, uh, we probably do not need to get the Attorney General approval any longer on zoning bylaws because we are now a city and uh, that uh, rule is applicable to towns but not to cities. Right. I just had a question because I thought the it's two thirds of what? thirteen equals. Press your button. Oh, just talking that way. Um, <laughs> so the other thing is, and now we're going down into the the rabbit hole. Uh, there's the rights of the property owner. So if you own property in Amherst, you, I mean, th there's extremes. So you feel that you, I mean, the one extreme is that those that feel that proper, their property should not be regulated. And then there's the extreme that all property should be regulated. But the one has to also consider someone who has bought property and it is expects to be able to do something with it, whether it be a single family house or a, auto repair store, you know, based on, you know, their reading of what the zoning bylaw is. And it takes some time, perhaps, to, to get that done. So there's concern always about down zoning. So that you buy land, you, you want to do a two family house, and by the time you get around to it, it's been down zoned, so you can only do a single family house. You basically have lost an opportunity to have an income stream that would help you pay for you know, you bought the land at a certain price, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that's always a concern with zoning changes is the town or the city taking away your right to develop something and who pays for that difference? Who pays for the delta of 
what you could have built versus what um, you can now build. So it doesn't mean that down zoning is illegal, it just means that that becomes a, possibly a contentious issue. So we don't need these goals because we're gonna solve everything today. <laughs> My suggestion is that uh, putting this on the chair, of course, since he's, since I'm not the chair, uh, that uh, the chair take the uh, discussion that uh, came today to think about a refinement on this document, uh, which you could send to this committee yep. um, as long as we don't respond to the yep. group, but only respond back to the chair or even more perfectly uh, save our response until the next meeting. Yep. And uh, then come back and have a further discussion of it because I think that there I will. has been a great discussion and a lot of good ideas have come forward and uh, both as uh, more specificity on how the processes work particularly, well we really did three because we did the uh, uh, questions with the relationship with the university, but that was a fairly brief discussion, much more on the master plan and zoning and uh, how the timeline fits together, the steps and the timeline. Perfect. I will do that. So I'll take us up to page 17 or whatever it is, and then we'll continue again. So we, we, we went through this one time when we were brand new, and I think it's actually very helpful to do it again. So let's do talk about our schedule. So, um, I don't think so because we have, you know, 12 minutes to go, and I, I think we do need to talk about. Well, um, yep. Go ahead. Another case. Right. Yep. Another case study will be the uh, public percentage for the money for the arts. That that was brought up to us. That is an issue that we can do. And I think I think it's going to be a heck of a lot easier than zoning in the master plan, but we do need to put time into that sometime in the future. So, so there, um, thank you for that. So in a way, the way that I see agendas developing over time is one are the kind of long-term goals um, that in many ways line up with the town council goals here. The other ones are things that fall in our lap through referral. So we don't have on here the public art, for example. So that is something that we need to deal with. And I think we should we need to have it on the next agenda, whenever that is. And then, but then we also need to be mindful. So we don't want to just be. So I think that I can envision that our committee meetings will have two parts to it. One is sort of the long term, sort of focusing on the, the goals of the council, and the second one are not to say emergencies, but things that have been referred to us or have fallen in on, into our laps. Could be other things. So I, we had initially talked about meeting every single week, and I think that, I, I don't think that's realistic. So I think it's really hard on staff, and I also think it's really hard on us. So, so the, um, I, and I, th I know we have a lot on our plate, so um, <laughs> I was going to propose that we meet once a month. I would love to see all of the committees get on, and I know finance committee might be different, but I'd love to see all the committees get on to kind of a once a month schedule, which is actually how they do it across the river in Northampton. But because I'm wondering if every other week, like every two weeks might be more realistic considering that we do have all of these goals we need to get started on. Yeah? I'm not sure I'm, as much as I would like to make it every other week. Uh, I don't think that's a good idea right now. I think we have things, as okay. you say, dropping on our plate yep. legitimately, and we're not prepared with any yep. kind of process to meet them. I feel like, look at the time that we took today just yep. to look at the goals, and I feel like, okay, that's basically done. We're looking at it, and we're saying, these timelines are okay. We're going to, with your help, refine the timelines. But I'm not comfortable with, definitely not yet comfortable with meeting once a month for two hours, you know, I, I would see it as a much longer process, yeah. and I'm, I'm as tired as I can get. I would like to meet every week, for now. 
Well, to answer the question for the Finance Committee, the Finance Committee doesn't have a balance of portfolio throughout the year because we were working towards a budget. Uh, as I reported at the very end of the meeting on Monday, uh, you know, into July, we now have three meetings scheduled as opposed to two meetings a week, and that's just the nature of it. Uh, as far as, but I think getting back to this committee, I would go um, with the idea of every other week for a little bit until we see, because I think that it does take some time between meetings to sort of recollect, to, to collect what has happened and to prepare for the next meeting, and to do that on a weekly schedule gets to be very uh, demanding. Uh, once a month doesn't get you the continuity, so uh, every other week, seems to be the, uh, what I would recommend and uh, additional then meetings if there are a particular matter referred that has a deadline to it. Uh, I don't think that the percent for arts has a deadline to it. I'll give my comment that I certainly could see meeting every other week, but I would like a more specific, um, as I said to you before, I see some of this it would be better as, almost as a course with homework, where we have certain documents that we are studying, looking at, and responding to, and we come together to do that, And which means that I guess I'm asking um, Steve, with, I will help in any way I can, to put together the syllabus. <laughs> but you know, and you've done them and I've done them. Once you've got the syllabus done, it's really gravy. Yeah, yeah. You know, but just because when we do our town council meetings, they, they, we have that list of documents. You read those documents, you begin to feel, okay, I'm prepared, I'm prepared. Um, so far, we haven't quite known how to, how to be prepared for these meetings because we're in the exploratory phase. Exactly. But we know we've got a lot we have to do. So if we had a more set agenda, I think we could handle it every two weeks. I could go along with that, but the important thing is knowing what we're going to be working on. Yeah. So 1% from our maybe isn't at our next meeting, but we have uh, speed limits. We haven't looked at those. We're, you know, there's, we need to know what we're going to be right. working on. Are we going to have the, the, the report of the parking working group is also going to come yep. to us. Great. And most importantly, we need to figure out what's important and what can wait. So like what's urgent and what's not urgent. And that, I think that's one thing that we're, we will struggle with. Like, like um, just because, and I, I'm, I think the speed, looking at the speed limit is a great idea, but because it, it's a great idea doesn't mean that it should bump um, you know, everything else. So there, there is a certain time management that we have to you know, get good at. There's also things that are, I think, are really important, like 132 North Duncan Road, I think I have the right address, mm -hmm. is an important issue. And right. we might be hearing the same things over and over, but I think that it's important to um, you know, give, give a place, whether, how imperfect as it may be, for uh, people to voice yeah. pros and cons, you know, you know, even though it's not on the you know, specific yeah, thing. No. And that's I, I, I like your, your flexible um, you response. I think that's very important that we have that, and, and you do that very well. Thank you. Um, so all of that said, <laughs> two weeks, I'm not going to be here. So I'm not going to be here on the 19th. So can you, can you share? Um, OK. <laughs> Let me take a look. No meeting on the 12th. So well, of course, the other thing we could do just to, is meet on the two-week schedule starting with the 12th if that oh, would true. give us meetings where yeah. the chair can be present. Okay. I, I'd be happy to do that. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. We'll meet on the 12th. So the agenda, <laughs> so let's talk about the agenda. So the agenda will be... Um, What, we should take a look at the public art. Um, we, we should. Yeah. We, we, need, um, we need an assignment. 
I can't get the board button. Okay, we need an assignment in, in master plan and zoning, perhaps. Yeah. Um, actually, one thing will be the planning board actually has public hearings tonight, I believe, on some of the zoning bylaws. Um, I was purposely mumbling because <laughs> I think the planning board is starting their public hearings on zoning bylaws. So here's another thing that we're not clear on, that would those come directly to us or do they go to the council then to us? I think they go to the council. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we can't. So public art, um, start chipping away. I'll look at what we have said for goals. Yeah. As far as public art is concerned, uh, I actually, because of the finance committee and because I've had the role on the select board of working as a select board liaison for the arts commission and developing the public arts bylaw all along, I'm sort of in this place where I have a different level of involvement with that already. Um, what I was going to do is to try and see if I could outline what the issues are and then share that with the president to make sure that the um, president's not in disagreement with that listing of what the issues are. And then um, as I thought about it, it seems that if the issues are identified, they should come here. We should not be starting with the proposed bylaw. We should be starting with what is the goals and limits. And um, as far as the finance committee is concerned, <coughs> there is a cost consequence to doing this and um, th th that needs to be understood too. So I'm trying to weave, I was thinking through it from both committees of which I'm a member as well as my prior expertise. Steve, is it realistic that we, if you and I work together to come back next Wednesday with a, with a draft syllabus, maybe outlining the next three months of meeting topics, and it's, you know, it's flexible. We'll, we'll be flexible, but at least we could have some benchmarks. Perfect. Yeah, okay. With that, yep. Okay, is there a second? Second. All in favor, raise your hand.